Thank you very much um, for agreeing to be um, part of the Shallow Legacies Day and to um, take part with this interview. Uh, nice to have you here. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask you um, about your role here at the Bodleian Library and your connection to the Shelley um, papers and manuscripts, so how you ended up here working with the Shelley manuscripts. Well, I came to work with the Bodleian back in 2008, 2009 to do a, an exhibition on Shelley um, here and in Dove Cottage in the Lake District and also in New York, so it was quite a big project. And then I got more involved with other things in the library and I'm now one of the permanent members of staff and one of my jobs, very nice part of my job, is to look after all the Shelley collections here. Can you give us an overview of sort of the Shelley family and, and what, we, what we sort of more commonly know about, about the, the Shelleys and, and the people that are sort of manifesting themselves in, in, in this archival collection? Yeah, so if we begin with a central figure, if you like, which is Percy Bysshe Shelley, this strange family name he has, Bysshe, which is how everyone called him, Bysshe Shelley. He was born into the English landed gentry, 1790s, and um, went to Oxford, where we are now, uh, was promptly expelled for publishing a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism, and then became a great poet, died young, he married Mary Shelley, his second wife, who is famous now, of course, as the, being the author of, of Frankenstein. And Mary Shelley's mother was Mary Wollstonecraft, the great figure of the Enlightenment who wrote about women education. And her father was William Godwin, who was one of the best known philosophers and writers of the day. So it's quite a literary family, really. Mm -hmm. And so the, the archives relating to that literary activity is here, a lot of it is here, and they led quite um, eventful personal lives, so there's a lot of correspondence sort of recording all of that. Could you um, tell us a little bit about what manuscripts survive then relating to these various um, people, so uh, the, the four sort of key players that you've just described, yeah. um, what, what material survives it and that's held here at the Bodleian? Okay, well let's start with William Godwin. We have a huge amount of his papers. We also have his diary, which he kept religiously for a lot of his life, a very concise, factual diary. There's quite a lot there. Um, which tells us about the period. He seemed to know everyone, so we know who he met and all that, that sort of thing. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft is a lot less. She lived a far more peripatetic sort of life, but we have some correspondence. And particularly, we have her correspondence with William Godwin, her husband, their love letters. Percy Bysshe Shelley, we have his literary papers, and if you like, the great treasure are the run of his notebooks, which he kept with him all his life and drafted all his poetry into. And we also have a lot of his correspondence, uh, including correspondence with Mary Shelley. Our most popular Mary Shelley manuscript is the original manuscript of Frankenstein. So that all comes together into really thousands of items telling us about their work, about their lives, how they composed, how they lived, that sort of thing. We also have a number of relics, as they were known. I don't think we'd call them relics now, perhaps, as if they're holy relics um, of things which belong to the Shelleys, portraits of them, really sort of family family heirlooms, if you like. Can you tell us how this collection ended up here at the Bodley? And given that you've already hinted at this sort of strange relationship uh, that Bish had with, uh, with Oxford, what's the sort of narrative and history there that brought these papers back um, to Oxford? So Shelley's uh, association with this university was brief. He came in uh, 1810 as an undergraduate and, as I say, published this notorious pamphlet. So I think it was after a term and a half uh, he was expelled. That was it for Oxford. I think he came back to visit Oxford, Shelley and Mary, uh, as part of a boating trip up the Thames, and they came to see Oxford. Other than that, really no association with the university at all. In the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, when Lady Shelley, who was the wife of the Shelley's only surviving child, Sir Percy Florence Shelley, gets quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, she had custody of all the family papers and she decided to forgive Oxford. Oxford, she thought, was the rightful place for the Shelley papers. So we have the Shelley, the whole Shelley archive. When Lady Shelley was deciding what to do with those papers, she divided them into three. A third was come to Oxford, here. A third was to go to the descendants of Shelley's brother, 
Percy Bysshe Shelley's brother, John, and another third was to go to their adopted daughter, Bessie, which became known as the Abinger Papers because Bessie married a Scarlet, who then became Lord Abingers, the Lord Abingers, and um, we bought those in 2004. So they, they came between 1893 and 2004. Mm. And do you have much of a sense of where um, the rest of the papers sort of ended up then? So you've got this, this collection here. Where else are the materials related to the Shelley family? Well, of course, with any correspondence, there are two sides to it. So if you imagine, um, let's say, the correspondence between Percy Bysshe Shelley and his friend Thomas Love Peacock, he, of course, will have, the, the Shelleys will have all of Thomas Love Peacock's letters, but the letters which Shelley wrote to Peacock would still be with Peacock. So they, you have to ask them back, which is quite a common thing, as you'd ask for their side of the correspondence back, and they'd either say yes or they'd say no. So with any correspondence, there's two sides. So there'll be the other side of the correspondence here and there. Um, there are notebooks in California, some Shelley notebooks. Uh, there are some uh, in London, I think, Shelley papers. Um, here and there, but really the bulk of it is here. Could you tell us a little bit um, about the, um, the Shelley's Ghost project then um, that resulted in, in your book? Shelley's Ghost was the title of the exhibition in the book that I worked on 2008 to 2010, I think it was, uh, where we really looked at the Shelley archive and what it meant at the time, what it means now, how it survived, how it was assembled, how it was displayed originally by the Shelleys and um, really celebrated that, that archive. One of the key things with that project that I sort of uh, it took away from, from the book was about this sense that the, um, the archive was heavily curated um, during its lifetime and, and during its various sort of curatorships within the family and then beyond. Um, yes. You know, so this uh, day, thinking about Shelley legacies, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, about that aspect of the collection. So as I think uh, I mentioned, uh, Shelley in particular, Percy Bysshe Shelley, had a very eventful life, quite a bit of scandal. Um, perhaps the most scandalous um, aspect of his life was his first marriage. So he married young, uh, a girl called Harriet, they lived together for a few years, but soon proved the marriage wasn't going to last. But before the marriage was over, Shelley met and fell in love with Mary, who became his second wife, Mary Shelley. And Lady Shelley, who I mentioned, so Shelley's daughter-in-law, was very keen to exonerate Shelley from any sort of bad behavior in relation to this, this messy business, and edited the letters in a way that reflected well on Shelley over this relationship. So that's just one example of how they'd use the archive to promote a certain image of the poet and, it, and by association of Mary Shelley herself. That, that any claim that Mary, if you like, ensnared Shelley, Lady Shelley was very keen to um, put over um, an alternative view. Mm. And um, they, th there was this sense that they also um, sort of limited access to those papers and were very um, careful about who they allowed access and didn't allow access and, and who also wrote uh, about the Shelleys and, um, and published work on them. Could you talk mm. a little bit about, about those people and, and that process as well? Yeah, well let's begin with the archive itself and, mm. and, and where it was. The Shelleys lived in Boscombe Manor, where you are today, or, or will be, <laughs> um, and they kept the papers there, and they kept it in what they called their Shelley Sanctum, which was a special room where the papers were kept, the relics were kept, and were displayed. Very few people were allowed in, and even if you were allowed in, you weren't necessarily allowed to see the books and the manuscripts there. You just went in and absorbed the atmosphere and were moved and um, profoundly impressed by the whole idea of the Shelleys and the family and these great treasures you were surrounded by. Um, while they were being kept there and jealously guarded, old friends of Shelley were writing about 
the life of Shelley, uh, including Thomas and Jefferson Hogg, who knew Shelley at Oxford, Thomas Love Peacock, who I mentioned, uh, Edward Trelawney, this kind of buccaneering type figure who knew them in Italy. And they obviously had their own part to play in the lives of these people and their own take on the, the activities. Um, so really, Jane Shelley in particular was keen to, if you like, convey what she saw as the truth by a very, very careful release of what was contained in the family papers. She tried to do that with Thomas Jefferson Hogg, who I um, mentioned. But when his book came out, and actually gave him some of the papers, lent him some of the papers so he could use them for this biography. When the first two volumes of this biography came out, they were so appalled that they immediately asked for the papers back. Sure. So in the archive here, there's a wonderful letter where Lady Shelley writes to her husband, Sir Percy. says, you must go and see Hogg now. Forget all your yachting and your amateur dramatics and your railways and everything, all of these things. This is far more important. Go and get these papers back. I'm wild with anxiety, she says, because she can see she's losing control of the papers and, and in that way losing control of the story that she's promoting, of, of, the, of, the, of the Shelley story. Um, so they learned from that and she then appointed an advisor, if you like, called Richard Garner, who worked at the British Museum, who advised her in literary matters and how to promote and publish these papers. So she published a book called uh, Shelley Memorials, I think in 1858, with Richard Garner's help, which was a very careful um, publication of some of the correspondence, some of the work, and um, really took it from there. I also got the sense that um, Jane uh, was one of a line of sort of editors of the papers, and she wasn't the first to do this. Um, Mary Shelley was also very keen on uh, sort of curating this legacy, it, it, it feels like, from, from the book that you wrote. Could you talk a little bit about her role in, in sort of managing that collection? Yes, yeah, so Mary was widowed at a very young age. I mean, um, Shelley was 30, I think, when he died, 1822. Mary Shelley was, was still in her 20s. She thought it was her, her responsibility to, to edit Shelley's papers. There was a lot of unpublished poetry, unpublished prose, and um, let the world know about this great writer. She did that in the face of great resistance from Shelley's father, Sir Timothy Shelley, who didn't want anything like that to happen, and threatened to withdraw the allowance he was giving to Mary's son, Sir Percy. Not Sir Percy then, just plain Percy Shelley if Mary published anything about Shelley's life. So she really, in the face of all this resistance, did heroic work in editing her husband's poetry, particularly if you look at the notebooks, as we might do later on, um, they're almost indecipherable. So she had to work out exactly what Shelley was writing, what, what, he, was, what he was composing. Um, so she did that as far as she could. She published a couple of volumes um, about a couple of volumes which um, contained the poetry, some of the prose. She was Shelley's first editor, if you like. Um, and then really the next, I suppose, big authorised um, edition was of the Shelley's correspondence called Shelley and Mary, which was very much a private publication that Lady Shelley and Sir Percy brought out of letters. Very, very small run of, I think it's something like, there are only 12 copies that we know about. Yeah. Um, and they very, very carefully edited the letters um, to make sure that the image was, was intact, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. You've talked about um, Sir Timothy Shelley and sort of his um, relationship with Mary. And I wondered if, from the, the manuscripts that are, uh, are in the collection, whether there's any sense of what life might have been like growing up for Percy Florence Shelley and, and his relationship to um, the, the wider Shelley family. Well, he would have grown up in Italy as a young boy when um, the Shelleys were still moving around Italy, living this very peripatetic life. But he would have been very young then. I don't believe he would have remembered much of that. So after Shelley's death, um, Mary came back to England with Percy. And Percy lived really a very conventional life. He went to a public school, I think it was Harrow, 
um, to Mary's great relief, he didn't resemble his um, father at all in terms of radical opinions or um, genius. He certainly he didn't have genius. Um, so he was a very conventional man who um, certainly honored the memory of his father, or me old father, as he referred to him, which is me old father, but he didn't worship his father. Um, but he obviously felt a responsibility towards his memory and towards the archive that, that he held. One of the things that has struck me in my own research is how he has, he sort of lives in the shadow of his great ancestors and isn't sort of recognised for his own interests or abilities or, or you know, whatever else. Um, and there's the caricature of Percy Florence Shelley where um, you know, the, the, uh, the title of that image is just the poet's son. You know, and there yes. he is in his 50 or 60th year and he's still there under, under this sort of great weight of literary giants, I suppose, yeah. um, and hasn't necessarily found his own place um, in that lineage. I wonder if you had a sense of whether there's a role of myth um, in this uh, legacy, the legacies that we understand today, what role myth had to play. Well, by myth, I suppose you could mean um, an image, if you like, of a poet, an, un an un unworldly poet. Matthew, um, Matthew Arnold famously called Shelley a beautiful, ineffectual angel, which is quite wrong, I think. But that was the description he gave of Shelley. Um, and you can use carefully composed portraits, posthumous portraits, you can use letters, you can use certain episodes in a life to present an image of that kind. Um, rather anodyne sort of um, harm, almost harmless image, rather than the kind of radical, rather dangerous, um, risky sort of intellectual life that, that Shelley, and I think Mary, who was herself an intellectual, lived. Um, is that what you meant by myth? I mean, possibly, yeah. I, I suppose um, anecdote as well uh, uh, comes into it. Some of the stories that we, um, we have about the Shelleys seem very anecdotal and, and have this sort of mythical feel. I'm thinking particularly of the, the story of the heart uh, and wondered if you had anything, any thoughts on that story and, and where that comes from and where it sort of sits in this. So Shelley's, Shelley um, drowned and his body was washed up on a beach in Italy, I think two weeks later, and cremated on the beach. And Trelawney, this uh, adventurer who I mentioned earlier, um, said that he plucked the heart from the pyre and preserved it. Um, that's what he says. And that the heart was then preserved by the family and uh, eventually buried in Bournemouth, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's talk in the um, so uh, there's the book that Lady Shelley wrote. Um, is it a conversation with Lady Shelley or something like that? That's right. Yeah. Um, and again, that's very anecdotal, and it talks about the sort of finding of these ashes in Boscombe Manor um, amongst uh, Mary's um, belongings after her death. Yes. Um, so you know, I just these feel sort of very anecdotal and. Uh, tenuous almost, um, I suppose. They are, and then, they're, as you say, they're, 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 they're sort of attaching specific powerful images like that to physical objects. So I, I think the ashes were kept along with Mary Shelley's journal. So they're, you know, there's this is very, very sort of um, intense, almost religious devotion to episodes and to physical things. From the work that you've done, um, do you have any sense of um, the role that Boscombe and Bournemouth have to play in this story? What, what sort of role do you see them playing uh, in the shaping of the uh, Shelley legacy? Well, I think it's very easy now to sort of look back rather scornfully at um, Lady Shelley's uh, ambition to control and shape the reputations of these great writers. But I think we should thank her as well because she did preserve all these papers, she did keep them together, she did um, look after them. And without that kind of guardianship, papers tend to get dispersed or destroyed, they, they can disappear. Um, so I think we should thank her for that and Boscombe was the place where they were held 
in this sanctum. Um, Lady Shelley was devoted to Mary, who she knew. She never knew Shelley, but she knew Mary Shelley. And I think a lot of her motivation came from making Mary Shelley's life as easy as possible and preserving um, the reputations of Mary and of Shelley. So I think we should respect her for that. And um, so Percy, you mentioned, didn't have didn't take his place in this great sort of pantheon of, of literary figures. But I don't think he wanted to. I think it was rather good that he, he sort of wasn't particularly oppressed by the memory of having a genius as a father and just lived his life as he wished to do it in Boscombe. And yet he was still a literary figure in a sense. He went and, and wrote these many plays, tens of you know, scores of plays um, that do still survive but have just been sort of totally... Um, sort of pushed aside. I wonder if you uh, had looked at any of these plays or had any insights into uh, the sorts of things he was writing about or...? or... Confess I haven't. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've looked at his diaries, we have the diaries here and they're, they're interesting and um, his letters are interesting and I, you sort of warm to him I think. Yeah, one of my, my questions actually was about that, about the, the sort of character of these individuals. I'm particularly interested in, in Lady Shelley and uh, Percy Florence Shelley at this moment in time. And Do you have a, an idea of what they may have been like as people from the, the materials that survive? Um, I can imagine them. I mean, I can imagine, you know, Lady Shelley is a rather formidable person. You wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of her. I imagine her taking things very seriously when it came to the Shelley legacy, but at the same time being a, a great companion if she if she took to you. Uh, so Percy, I imagine, is a rather amiable, um, not unintelligent uh, figure, and I can I can imagine them playing a, a big part in local life. I imagine the very local figures um, supporting Boscombe activities, um, worthy causes, that sort of thing not in any way a kind of remote um, place, Boscombe. I think the sanctum was kept very carefully apart from the hoi polloi, as they might have seen them. Um, but, but generally, I think I imagine it was a very open kind of house um, that played a large part in, as I say, the local activities. You're absolutely right. I mean, there is a sense from reading the diaries that he was a sociable figure and that when in London, which they spent you know, quite a lot of their time in London, um, they were very much moving in artistic networks, you know, they were mm. corresponding and meeting up with people from the theatre, going to the Garrick Club, um, they were having artists around for dinner and bumping into them in, in, in the street. Uh, they lived in Tite Street, which was this really famous sort of um, uh, hub of uh, artistic people at that time, including Whistler, um, for example. Um, and Robert Louis Stevenson was a friend of theirs. Th that's right. Could you tell us a little bit about um, Mary and Percy Bysshe's uh, sort of status and reputation in their own time? Well, I think it's important to remember that for much of their adult lives, they were exiles. They were in Italy and they were participating as far as they could in, in political and social English life from Italy. And they weren't famous as authors then, they are now, but then they really weren't, certainly nothing like Byron was who, as Byron said, I woke and found myself famous after he published the first part of Child Harold. Everyone knew Byron. Not many people would have read or even heard of Shelley. Um, Frankenstein, when it was first published, was published anonymously. So no one would have known of, of Mary as the author of Frankenstein, and nor was it particularly popular when it was first published. So really their reputation comes after their deaths. Um, so when Shelley dies, the age of 30, his legacy is um, perpetuated by Mary, first of all, by editing his works uh, from his manuscripts, which are really fiendish to read. So that was really a, a heroic um, thing to do. And she says as much, I, you know, I was going crazy trying to read this stuff. So she was really the first person to promote Shelley as a great writer. And Mary becomes more famous when Frankenstein is adapted for the theatre. And much more people hear of Frankenstein and read Frankenstein as a result of that adaptation. And she finds herself quite celebrated after that. Um, while she is living as a widower, 
now back in England, Shelley's friends are publishing their account of Shelley's life, which is scandalous, as we've talked about. Um, so in a way, that becomes quite an important part of their reputation. Um, regrettably, you might think, rather than concentrating on their writing, they're concentrating on the lives perhaps too much. Um, but as the Victorian age continues, they become more and more recognised as the great writers that they are. But it does take a little while. And can you say something about the, um, the collection that was donated by Lady Shelley? Um, I understand that some of the material she purposely sort of embargoed and, and um, restricted access um, to for, for public viewing. Um, what, what was that material and do we know why she did that? So there were two types of you like um, treasures that she gave to the library. One were things which were really she wanted displayed and which were displayed, which were relics of the life, portraits, that sort of thing. Then there were manuscripts which she really didn't want generally known, particularly a box of correspondence which wasn't to be opened till a century after the poet's death, 1922. And after it was opened, it could only be consulted by researchers, by readers, with the express permission of the library curators, which is the governing body. So that's about as strict as an embargo as you can put on a literary archive, I would say. And that wasn't officially lifted until 1992. It had become meaningless by then because everything had been published. So she was very keen to control what the library did with, with this archive. The uh, family essentially created a grave uh, there, a sort of family plot. Uh, and I wonder if you could tell the little story behind that plot. Well, the burial of the or burials of the various members of this family is complicated because um, Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary's mother, was buried in St Pancras churchyard. And Shelley, of course, was cremated on the beach in Italy. So there were his mortal remains were the ashes and, as we've talked about, the heart. And um, William Godwin was, I think, also buried in London. Is that right? St Pancras as well. Think, uh, yeah. Also in St Pancras. So. Which is which is the churchyard is famous because that when um, in the Shelley story because when Shelley and Mary were getting to know each other, if you like, they used to go to Mary Wollstonecraft's grave. That's where they really got to know each other. Um, so when Sir Percy died and Lady Shelley died, they were buried in Bournemouth Churchyard. Um, but before that, I think St Pancras Churchyard had been changed. There was some big development, wasn't there? That's right. Uh, which meant the bodies had to be exhumed yes. before that development took place. And they were moved to... Um, the family plot in Bournemouth, That's right. yeah. where, they, where Shelley's heart eventually joined them. Mm. Yeah. So it all, what I find amusing is that William Godwin's um, second wife, uh, who was also buried at St Pancras, didn't come with them. She just stayed in St Pancras because really? she wasn't part of the inner circle. <laughs> But, you know, I see this sort of family plot as part of this curation of the legacies, really, pulling together these various bodies uh, and making a physical yes. site for, um, for pilgrimage, essentially. Absolutely, yes. So we've talked about the Shelley Sanctum and all these treasures that were kept in this special place in Boscombe. And so I just thought I would show you some of these treasures, which are kept here now in the Bodleian. Uh, which visitors to the sanctum would have seen. So, and we get, I think, quite a good idea of the sort of place it was. So here, for example, we have a matching set of portraits of Shelley as a young boy and Mary Shelley as a young woman. This one's certainly posthumous. This was done from people's memory of Mary Shelley and this one from an, uh, from an original portrait that was made when Shelley was still very young. But you can see how Shelley and Mary would have been um, seen uh, through portraits like this. In these wonderful gilt frames. Mary Shelley, a redhead, as you can see from the very pale skin. The famous Shelley blue eyes. This is what people would have seen in the sanctum. 
another miniature, which was probably commissioned by Lady Shelley, is an extremely idealised portrait of Shelley's sisters, Helen and Margaret, as young ladies. She would have never known them as young ladies. They were old ladies by the time she knew them. Um, this was made by, uh, painted by Sir William Ross, who was the leading miniaturist of the day. And I don't know if we can focus in on a necklace which is around the neck of Margaret Shelley with a little brooch in the middle. We do actually have this necklace in the collection, which is here with a little label explaining what it is. Um, and what it says is this necklace here is actually made of hair, Mary Wollstonecraft's hair. So this is the hair of Mary Shelley's mother. Hair jewellery, which I think we're quite squeamish about now, uh, was very common then. You had jewellers who specialised in making precious things out of the hair of the deceased. And this is one example of that. And there are two pendants coming, uh, hanging from the main necklace uh, with the initials PBS MWS, so Percy Bysshe Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, with little locks of hair within those lockets. We also talked about how when the uh, collections first came to the body, and they came with this embargo on who could see them and when. And this is a copy of Shelley and Mary, the edition of correspondence that Lady Shelley and Sir Percy Shelley brought out. Um, and even here you can see there's this very stern label around it explaining how it was to be consulted when it was in the Bodleian. Volumes given under condition. The following volumes were referred to in the conditions printed on the previous page. Until July 9th, 1922, they must be kept apart and not allowed to be seen by any person except the curators and Bodley's librarian, in other words, the senior librarian. And no copy of any portion of them may be taken by anyone. The great treasures really, as I say, are the Shelley notebooks, that's what I believe anyway, which are the notebooks in which he drafted all his great poetry. Um, and they're all kept in Boscombe in these rather ornate green boxes. And they're usually labelled by Lady Shelley as to what's in the particular notebooks. A little library label there about how you were to see it. Um, so these would all have been kept by the Shelleys in Bournemouth and barely seen by anyone. Only a favoured few, a few trusted people would have seen them. Now scholars can come and if they have enough, good enough reason, we're very happy to make them available. But they are, they are fragile and they're very, very precious. And they have these, these vellum bindings, um, keep them tough because they saw quite heavy use at the time. I have to be very careful about how I open them. I don't know if you can see. You just have an example of, of, this is actually very easy to read. But um, this is the kind of thing that we have here.